The number one prayer God is most likely to answer is the number one prayer we are most afraid to pray. Let me say that again. The number one prayer God is most likely to answer is the number one prayer that we are most afraid to pray. All of the most significant moments in your life usually involve a common denominator. It's a really honest conversation. Maybe it's the conversation that you had with another person where you began to realize that you were meant for each other for the rest of your lives. Or maybe it's a conversation where after there had been some distance and tension with an adolescent in your home, there seemed to be a reconnection and things seemed to be getting a little bit better. Or maybe a conversation around the table that wound up going late into the evening because you found someone who seemed to understand you and you had a common, not experience only, but maybe a future as well. These conversations aren't rehearsed. There's a kind of vulnerability that we open ourselves up with and something begins to happen. And I think that's what God has in mind when it comes to prayer. Prayer is supposed to be a conversation with him. But when religion starts trying to program it, it often feels, makes us feel a little bit self-conscious. We can feel a little bit awkward and it can feel like it's a little bit rehearsed. So let's uh, try something. How many remember the very first prayer you were ever taught? Do you remember? What was it, what was it called? What was it? The Lord's Prayer? Did anybody learn before the Lord's Prayer? Did anyone learn, now I lay me down to sleep? Yeah, okay. So uh, how many learned that prayer? All right, let's see if you can still remember it. All right, let's all say it together. Now I... If I should die before I wake. It's, a, it's like we're trying to terrorize the little children. <laughs> you close your eyes and you never know. You might not wake up again, but if you don't, we're, we're trusting God to take care of you in that moment. These, these little terror prayers that we teach our children. We actually changed the words with our children. As a pastor, I didn't feel it was necessary to terrorize them with prayer. I, I thought as a father I could do that without prayer. And so we changed the, uh, if I should die before I wake line to, thy love stay with me through the night and wake me with the morning light. We just thought that was a kinder, gentler way to teach children to pray. But often it feels like our prayers are just kind of rehearsed and if we're asked to say them out loud in front of other people, we often feel awkward and self-conscious. I'm going to tell you something that will sound strange for a pastor to say. Prayer doesn't work. It's God that works. And when we think that it's our prayer that does the work, we wind up seeing prayer as nothing more than a formula that we have to get the right words in the right order. It almost becomes an incantation so that we can get what we want. And we assume when it doesn't happen for us that maybe that's relegated to a certain few spiritually elite people who have the special ability to have their prayers answered. We tend to see prayer as more of a burden than as an opportunity. And here's the thing. When we feel that way about prayer, we don't pray very much. And when you don't pray, there are times that you are going to feel completely alone. And by the way, you can be in a room like this surrounded by people and still feel very alone. When you can't talk to someone about something, you feel isolated. You feel like you don't belong. And when you feel that way, you will carry a kind of pain that you're going to do one of two things with. Either you're going to try to find ways to numb it, or you're going to try to find ways to inflict it on other people. And if you deny it, you just pass it on to others. But when you truly learn to pray, not only is this pain in our life dealt with, but we actually gain some insight to be able to see this pain in other people's lives and have a way to be able to meet and minister to them. So if you don't pray, you will always feel like an outsider when it comes to religious things or spiritual things. Why is this? Because you were created, created to belong. If you don't really have much of a prayer life, it will always feel like 
those, me and them, instead of us. You always feel a little bit disconnected. There is such a primal urge in us to belong that we spend a lot of our lives trying to fit in and try to seek approval so that we do belong. But here's what you need to know. Fitting in and seeking approval is just nothing more than a cheap substitute for what God intended when it comes to us believe, actually belonging to someone or to something. Real belonging isn't something you achieve. Real belonging is something you receive. You belong to God, and God belongs to you, and it's not based on something you did for him. It's not a test that you passed. He revealed how valuable we are to him when he gave the life of his one and only son so that we would be able to spend eternity with him. The challenge is we will never experience the fullness of that truth outside of prayer. Now, what I will tell you is that actually everybody talks to God, even people who don't believe in him. There's this intuitive thing that people do in certain situations. For example, if you're driving down the road and you get pulled over by a police officer, even if you don't believe in God, you'll say something like, please, God, let me not get a ticket, and I promise I will never speed again. Or sometimes, even if we don't believe in God, we'll say things like, God, why is this happening to me? Or sometimes we'll acknowledge how unfair not just life is, but how unfair we believe God is, even if we don't think that he exists. It's a fascinating thing to watch people do. And sometimes when we're facing the desperation of incredible loss, we'll just tell God, I don't know if I can get through this without that person in my life. I don't think I can make it. And we'll ask God to somehow heal or restore. Sometimes we pray selfish prayers. Prayers like, let me win the contest, or let me be the, on the team, or let me pass the test, or let me win the lottery. And sometimes we experience something really wonderful in our lives, and we'll just pray, oh God, let that happen again in my life. As universal as all of these prayers are, and everyone prays them, as universal as they are, they are not deep and they won't reveal to us the incredible riches of God's grace. You can pray a lot of these prayers and never feel like you belong to God. There is, however, a kind of prayer that will deeply connect you to God. The challenge is, is this kind of prayer is counterintuitive to us. We are often unwilling to go there. And so I'd like us to find the courage to pray the prayer we're most afraid to pray because it's the one God most wants to answer. And we'll get some insight into this in Psalm 139, and I'd like us to read this out loud and together. We're going to read this passage together. Ready? Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The most important skill to develop in prayer is humility. Humility will dramatically improve your confidence in prayer. This, is, this is, doesn't seem like that's true to us. It feels like we have to develop confidence that we bring to prayer. But if you bring humility to prayer, you will actually gain confidence in your prayer. So what does it mean to be humble? What are, what are the components of being humble? And the first component is, of being humble is to acknowledge, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Let's just all say that out loud and together. Ready? I could be... Some of you couldn't say it, could you? Some of you, your lips did not move because you don't think that's possible. You think that others are always wrong. But hear me, there is an incredible world of wisdom that becomes available to anyone who realizes they might be wrong about something or they might be handling something in a wrong way. If you are always right, then the only option you have in life is to convince other people and argue a lot. But if you're willing to admit that you might be wrong, you can learn a lot. And so, I might be wrong. The second component of humility is, I could be better. I could be better. 
Now, I'm going to ask you to scan back in your memory banks to about a decade ago and see if there's anything in your past 10 years or more ago in which it is embarrassing for you to acknowledge that you spoke or acted in such a way. Does anyone have such a memory? Yeah, and here's the thing about that. We look back and we say, what was I thinking? I was such a jerk. I can't believe what an idiot I was. And here's what I want you to know. Ten years from now, you're going to look back to this time, and you're going to say to yourself, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I'm such a jerk. I'm such an idiot. And if you don't have a memory like that uh, uh, ten years ago, it doesn't mean that you were right. It means you haven't learned anything in ten years. That's what that means. So, I could be better. Last component of humility, I don't know how. I don't know how. We don't know how to discover where it is that we are wrong. Don't get me wrong on that. There's lots of people who will tell us, but we're not sure we can trust them. Because there are people who will blame us for stuff we had nothing to do with. They just didn't like the outcome, and they took it out on us. We don't know how to improve, even when we know what to improve. So we make promises, and we try really hard, and then we feel things, everything from disappointment to disqualification. And it's not what God intends. So if we are going to embrace humility in the conversations that we have with God, there's some questions that are worth asking. And the first question is this, what am I doing that is hurting myself or someone else in my life? What am I doing that's hurting myself or someone else in my life? And please, I would just challenge you. I, I, I suppose it's not appropriate for a pastor to say, I dare you, but I dare you. Get alone in quiet with God for a few minutes and ask this question, and it's amazing how many things you'll start having come to your mind and some insight that you begin to gain. And uh, we'll talk in just a minute about how to process that. But the point is, is that God is not going to speak to you th with an audible voice about this. He's just going to bring things into your insight that you begin to understand. This is something that is actually hurting me or hurting people that I love. And then don't forget to ask the question, why? Why do I do that? See, a lot of us just focus on what we're doing and not why we're doing it. Why do I feel compelled? Why am I trapped in that pattern? Why do I keep repeating this over and over even when I know it's not good for me? And it's astonishing how much insight God will give us. Second question, what is an area I could improve in? What's an area I could get a little better in? I'm not talking about if you could be perfect, but you could just improve. What is something that you could improve in? And here's the question to ask about that. Why have I not taken those steps yet? What is it that's holding me back? Last question. What am I hiding from? If you will get alone with God even for a few minutes and ask him that question, what gets revealed to you in the next few minutes would fill journals. Because we hide from a lot of things. And there are reasons. And we need to learn to ask ourselves and to ask God, what am I hiding from? And what am I afraid of? And what do I think I will really lose? Now, when we embrace humility, this begins to help us. When we don't embrace humility, we actually begin to pray in our own name. Now, we just had wonderful prayers for precious little children a few minutes ago up here, and I ended every prayer in the same way. I, I prayed for God's blessing on them, and then I asked it in Jesus' name. How many here probably would have noticed if when I got to the prayer, I said, and we ask this in the name of Pastor Bob, <laughs> amen. How many would have noticed, you know? And, uh, and we say, well, I would never do something like that. Oh, yes, we do, but just not like that. This is how we pray in our own name. We pray in our own name by reminding God of all the things that we have done for him. After all, I show up at church regularly. I give generously. I serve faithfully. 
I read the scriptures. I say my prayers. Why, do, why are we saying all of that to God? Why do we remind him of the things that we have done? Because we think we've created a debt of obligation, and now he's obligated to help us. Please understand this. God does not answer our prayers because we are good. God answers our prayers because he is good. That's the difference. So the reason we pray in Jesus' name is because Jesus reminds us and illustrates so vividly how incredibly loving God is, how incredibly generous God is, how incredibly powerful God is, how incredibly wise God is. When you look at the life of Jesus, you see what God is really like, and so that's why you pray in Jesus' name, because that's who God really is. That is what he is really like. But when you go in, you know, oh, this person has done so much for God's people and done so much for their family, and, and God, please heal them. What are we saying? They've obligated you. Trust me, the cross of Christ obligates God far more than anything we will ever do. He did that because he loves us. So we have to learn not to pray in our own name. This is why humility is absolutely essential for our prayer life. When God shows these things to us about things we're doing that are wrong or ways that we're doing that are wrong or things that we can improve, it is not to put us down or push us away. He reveals these things to us so that we will know how much he loves us so that he will begin to build us up so we can actually handle the blessings that he wants to pour into us. If you can't trust God with the truth about your past, you will never trust God with what he intends to do with your future. If you can't have the conversation about what you got wrong, then you'll never trust him when it comes to what he intends to do. Humility actually builds trust in the character of God because he always wants our best interests. That's what, he has no other motive, he has no other agenda, he wants what's best for us. And humility teaches us to hope in his power because he can do anything. If he could raise Christ from the dead, he can do anything. But he will not use his power to violate his character or to abandon us. And this is something that is challenging for us to understand. Our confidence in prayer is not that God will give us whatever we want. Our confidence in prayer is that God will not give us anything that would be harmful to us or to those that we love. But in every other way, he's generally and generously disposed to give to us. Now, we've all heard the stories about genies and about lamps and about wishes. And there's one common denominator of all those stories, and that is that our desires are often unwise. You see, we always see the benefits of God answering our prayers. I mean, if God would just do what we ask, wouldn't life be better? Life would be better for you. But what would that do to other people? Part of your frustration in life is that life is better for someone else and not for you. Prayer is not a way to turn the tables. Prayer is something else. So prayer, when we come to God, what we're asking is not just to see the benefits, but we can also trust that he can see the side effects and the consequences of something that we're asking for that maybe we would not be aware of. And his loving, generous heart will always do the right thing. You can trust the character of God. So how do you learn to go deep in prayer? Well, first of all, remind yourself of the goodness and greatness of God. Notice I did not say remind him of his goodness and greatness. God does not have a fragile ego that requires us to constantly tell him how good he is so that he will stay on his good side and he will be predisposed to give us what it is that we ask for. That's not the purpose of acknowledging or reminding ourselves of his goodness and greatness. The reason we remind ourselves is because that's what gives us confidence for the next set of prayers that we are going to pray. God is good, and God is great, and that's why we can bring these things to him. If we don't learn to pray these things, if we don't learn to pray the humble things and the true things, then we will never be able to pray the, the prayers that so desperately need to be answered in our lives. 
Remember, when something comes to your mind that you need to address, it is not God rejecting you. It is God redirecting you. He's not trying to put you down or give reasons why he can't do something in your life. The only reason he calls something to our attention is to redirect us back to himself. And ask God to help you understand the why of your weakness. Why is that a weakness in your life? Why do you tend to fall into that trap consistently? Why do you fail to take steps that would be beneficial to you in situations like that? And then lastly, ask God for a step to take rather than asking him to take it away. See, a lot of our prayers are all about taking away pain and making us more comfortable. And what I will tell you is that doesn't offend God that we pray a prayer like that, but that's not always his agenda. His agenda is not just to make us comfortable or pain-free. His agenda is that he will build us into the sons and daughters that he intended for us to be. And so we have to be willing to ask, what, what is the why behind it? I know what it is that I keep doing, but why do I keep doing it? Very powerful prayer to pray. And until we begin to gain insights, here's what I want you to see about spiritual insight. Until we begin to gain insight about our own weaknesses, we will never be able to see the greatness and the glory of God. It's the same set of spiritual eyes. It's the same kind of vision. Prayer involves a kind of honesty that you will not find an equal to in any human relationship. True prayer will disintegrate every form of deception in your conversation with God. Now, there is an ancient word that is used to describe this kind of humble prayer, and that word is confession. And what people have discovered throughout the ages is that this prayer is incredibly freeing and it is incredibly helpful. Please understand, we cannot expect our prayers to change our world if we are unwilling to allow our prayers to change ourselves. The reason that the church has lost its confidence in its prayer is because they're not seeing any internal changes. And it is when we begin to see what God is doing in us that we begin to have confidence that God will do something through us. So when you pray prayers like this, you will notice something. You will notice a tension that begins to develop in you, almost like a disagreement that you have with yourself. There will be a part of you that wants God to reveal the things that you're getting wrong or the things that you could improve. And there will be a part of you that does not want God to reveal. So what does this say about you? It says that you are human. And as a human, you are not perfect. And it says that God is at work in your life. If that tension does not exist, either we're deceived about ourselves or we're disinterested in God. But we can come to God and pray these incredibly bold, humble prayers. And God will begin to reveal incredible things to us. It is a wise person that understands that that tension means God is at work in your life. So here's what I'd like us to do. We read it before as a passage of scripture. I'd like us to read it together as a prayer this morning. Let's say this together and out loud. Search me, God and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's bow our heads this morning. I know that there's lots of people who have heard how weak they are, how bad they are, how much less they are than someone else or some expectation that people set up for you. And I know that when I have a talk like this, you think that God's going to do that to you too. And he isn't. It's not who he is and it's not what he does. The reason he calls these things to our attention is because we were created for so much more. And it's not until you experience the forgiveness of God for yourself that you know how incredibly loving he is and how powerful his grace can be. So it starts with just admitting, I could be wrong. And I could be better. 
and I don't know how to handle this. But I'm asking you to speak into my life. And this is what I would tell you. If you will do this even two or three times this week and take it seriously, what God shows you will be so powerful in your life that you will not go another week in your life without doing it again. And it's not because it's a ritual and it's not because it's a rehearsed prayer. It's just because you begin to realize how much God loves you and how much he wants to do for you. So Father... Help us learn to pray the deep prayer of humility. It's the one we're most afraid of, but the one you most want to answer in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.